Thanks for joining the Zootown Podcast, which is a video this week. Uh, and we have the distinct pleasure of sitting down with Mr. Brian Zond. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Scott. Got to bring him in uh, last week. Uh, well, his flight was delayed, <laughs> so got one less day here. Um, and then he actually got to preach on Sunday. So what's that like, coming to a town you've never been to and sharing a message? It's like my life. <laughs> <laughs> I do this a lot. Good. Uh, I, I really enjoyed your church. It's a good church. Uh, I, I don't really know what we're going to talk about. You gave me like one little word, maybe. Right. But I think your church, in my mind, represents something of the hope for the future of the church right. that I would see in North America. But I remember, sincerely, I had a good time. Good. Preached, you know, sinners in the hands of a loving God. Yeah. So what we did was, is we actually gave our, that book out to our congregation and uh, actually sold out the first round mm -hmm. uh, and had to order some more. And so that was just a good, that was a good uh, service, but it was really a culmination of four years of five years of planting a new culture. Um, yeah. And as you know, you did it 20 years ago. So let yeah. our audience know, because again, we've been talking about Zootown, about a reformation and all that stuff, but you went through this 20 years, 20 years ago. ago so. Yeah. Just tell us about that experience and, you know, you and I chatted about it, but sure. just, you know, where you were at in ministry and life and what God said. Yeah, well, you know, a little bit of my background. I'm a, I'm a Jesus freak. That's what I am. Uh, There's well, a song by I, DC Talk. I, I know. This, this, this way predates that. This okay. is way before that. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an OG Jesus freak, All okay? Right. So, you know, I had a dramatic encounter with Jesus Christ in my teen years. And overnight, I went from being the high school Zeppelin freak to the high school Jesus freak, although I still like Zeppelin. Come on. Yeah, all right. At least yeah, still you didn't like throw Zeppelin, Zeppelin out. No, I that. didn't. All right. um, <clears throat> and by the time I was 17, I was leading a ministry. It's called the Catacombs. It was more or less a music venue, subterranean, underneath kind of a dive bar on 3rd Street. And... Uh, by, the, by 1981, when I was 22, this had turned into our church, Word of Life Church, where I have now been the pastor for coming up on 42 years. Congratulations. Um, so we started, you know. So one church for 42 years. One church, mm -hmm. one church. We started more than one congregation, but one church. <laughs> <laughs> we started as, a, you know, a, good way to put a Jesus freak movement <laughs> church. Stayed small for about seven years, and then we had enormous growth that to this day I can't really fully account for how it happened, why it happened, but it did happen. Mm. It was a wild ride. It was fun. You know, I don't think it was bad. It was, it was exhilarating. You know, I mean, just like almost every Sunday is like record attendance. You know, I would look around on Sunday morning and think, who are these people? Yeah. <laughs> Where are they coming from? And that was great. And then we constructed a 2,500-seat sanctuary and moved in in uh, April of 1996. And so things are just cruising along. We're, we're doing good. By all of the metrics that Americans like to measure success, we had it made in the shade. And that's when, coming into the 21st century, coming into my 40s, you know, around the year 2000, I started to feel discontent. Now, everything, everything around me is great. And there's no problems. Church is growing. Everybody's happy. They love what I'm doing. Got a great team. Everything's great. And here, I'm beginning to feel slightly discontent, perhaps a bit disillusioned. You know, what had been perhaps my original dreams of ministry were all coming true, had come true. But I began to be disillusioned with Christianity, American style. I didn't have any kind of crisis of faith regarding Jesus. Jesus continues to this day and at that time, all through this, I'm just utterly fascinated by Jesus. But I began to sense that Jesus deserved a better Christianity than I knew. And... I, I eventually, over time, just became convinced that the Christianity I knew was too consumerist, too thin, too modern, and too American. And I didn't quite know what to do about it. I, because, you know, you don't know what you don't know. 
But what was spurring you on in that? Like a book? Well, who knows? Or? No, there, at the, initially there wasn't any book. It was just a feeling, a sense, something in the air. I'm like Bill Bull Baggins saying, I, I feel thin, <laughs> stretched, like, like butter scraped over too much bread. It, it was just an intuition. So I hadn't read anything. Uh, and that was also an issue. Uh, I had read everything that anybody would probably read in my charismatic American context. And I was bored with them. <laughs> and I didn't need to read any more of those books because I already knew what they said. Yeah, they're all saying the same just, thing. just tell me the author, the title, and I'll tell you what's in it. Um, and so I didn't, know, I didn't know where to go, Scott. Um, I was embarrassingly ignorant of what I would today call the good stuff. And so, just like out of instinct, I thought, well, I just need to back up as far as I can. That is, you know, the Christian church is 2,000 years. Let's just rewind the tape as far as I can. I knew the scriptures. I knew the New Testament. But what comes next as far as the church and its writings? Well, you have the church fathers. And so I began to read the church fathers, which I'd never done. I was like vaguely aware that there were these early theologians that they called church fathers. I couldn't have probably named any of them. Maybe Augustine. I would have said Augustine. Yeah, me too. And you uh, know, it's funny is when I heard church fathers, just in my context, I thought of Luther. And oh, all, yeah. And yeah. I'm like, now that I know, those weren't the church fathers. <laughs> no, that's they were. Uh, that's 1500 years later. Long. <laughs> so yeah. So and I so I just I just also. started reading them. You know, I kind of started with the very earliest ones, like you know Polycarp and. Justin Martyr and people like that and made my way into Tertullian and Irenaeus and Athanasius. And this was great. Now, I'm reading it without assistance. I'm reading it without having much context. I'm just finding these ancient... I mean, I just bought, an, you know, like, I don't know how many volumes, like, like 24 volumes, maybe it's more than that, 32 volumes, I don't remember, of Church Fathers. And without being too systematic, just reading them. And what this did was alert me to the truth that there were other ways of thinking about and talking about the Christian faith than I was familiar with, and, and ways that had a long ancient pedigree. And, so, and, and then to supplement that, I also returned to what had been an earlier interest of mine, and that's philosophy, which very early in my life, you know, in my teens and in my 20s, I loved philosophy. But once you know you're finally established within a word of faith charismatic, you, this may come as a surprise to you, but not every word of faith pastor reads a lot of philosophy. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. And so, so I started reading those two things, patristics, philosophy. They actually go together. I probably didn't know that at the time, but most of the church fathers were at least somewhat um, schooled in Greek philosophy. Yeah, and, and they actually believe Aristotle and Plato and them were forerunners of yeah, Christ. Yeah, they, they would even describe at times Plato as a proto-Christian. Yep, yeah, absolutely. so, so they, were, they were, and the Apostle Paul as well, a great philosopher. He, he was clearly familiar with Plato and Plotinus, as, as was John, whoever exactly the author of the fourth gospel and the epistles are, whether it's John Zebedee or right. another John, whoever they they were familiar with these. So anyway, I'm doing, I did that for about four years. And then I reached the point where there was just, there was this tension. There was that which I knew contemporaneously and that which I was learning from a more ancient faith. And I had no clue of how to put them together. And at the beginning of 2004, so it's just really coming up on 20 years, I did something crazy, radical, desperate. I would not recommend this to anybody. Who, if anybody's watching this, I don't know. I suppose somebody must be. Uh, I'm not telling you to do this. <laughs> I'll tell you not to do this. But I began the first 22 days of 2004 with doing nothing but praying, uh, preaching when I'm supposed to, sleeping at night. That's it. That's all I did. I didn't even really know how to pray then, but I put in the time. I didn't eat. I didn't, I didn't go anywhere. I just I found out you could drive back and forth for 22 days between my house and the church on one tank of gas. <laughs> and uh, I, I got down to 130 pounds. 
and people they didn't people were worried about me people thought you know they thought i was dying and in one sense i was dying the whole first half of life was dying coming out of that and and this was it, this was just my desperate bid because i thought I've reached the point in my life, I'm in I'm midlife, I was 45 at that time, so, or, as, or as I say, halfway to 90. And that'll put the fear of God in. You've seen 45, okay, 45, halfway to 90, pal. And it's like, okay, I better, if I'm going to lay hold of something new, I got to do it now. And um, shortly after that, I was sensing this, I sensed that I needed to find something more contemporary than the church fathers. I, I, I was benefiting, but you know, there was such a historical and cultural gap between, you know, what Gregory of Nyssa was doing, right, in the Byzantine Empire and what I'm trying to do in America in the 21st century. I prayed one day. I was in my house and I said, God, show me what to read. Because I sensed that that something that I would read would be a gateway. But I, didn't, I just didn't know what it was. I had no idea. I said, God, show me what to read. And I sat back down. And I was kind of dejected. I was sitting on a couch. And Perry, my wife, she walks into the room not five minutes later. She has no idea what I've prayed. She has no idea. I've just prayed, God, show me what to read. Perry walks in the room, walks up to me and hands me a book. She says, here, I think you should read this. <laughs> and I was like, well, that was spooky. And so Perry's God. <laughs> well, she hears from God. God talks to her. But, it, but here's the thing. It's, it's stranger than that. Perry had not read this book. Stranger yet. Perry simply found the book in her house and neither of us brought it home. We, to this day, have no idea how this book ended up in our house. Well, the next day I was on a plane somewhere to go off and preach as I so often did. I opened up this book, began to read, and it was like a door was just kicked open in my mind. It's like, you know, you see the police when they go to break down those doors and they have those battering ram things. Right. And all kinds of new, wonderful, beautiful ideas were being poured into my soul. Everybody says, what's the book? The book was The Divine Conspiracy by Dallas Willard. And you know how sometimes you just one thing can lead to another? Yeah. And then it was just like... And I would find... I mean, I didn't know N.T. Wright, but, but suddenly I did. Yeah. I didn't know Walter Brueggemann, but suddenly I did. You know, I, I didn't know Stanley Hauerwas, but suddenly I did. I didn't know David Bentley Hart, but suddenly I did. And I would binge read all the words. And, and these guys are prolific. Yeah, that's, that's not, and that's so I was reading, read. <laughs> you know, maybe six hours a night. And never seeing it as work. Never feeling that it was drudgery. It was like I'd struck gold and couldn't pull it out of the ground fast enough. It was like, where have you been all of my life? And so this was happening at a, you know, an astounding rate. And of course, you, know, you, start, you, you find the theology that in one sense you've looked for all your life. And you're a preacher. It's going to change you. Right. you know, and so my preaching changed. I would say it became much more substantive. It became much more theologically informed. To make it very simple, it became much better, right. in my opinion. Not everyone shared my opinion. <laughs> and uh, there were certain things I was beginning to critique. We can talk about those if you like. But yeah. the one that stood out, there were, there were numerous ones that I think the church mostly could have handled and said, okay, all right, we'll, we'll come with you. It is, it's when I began to critique America as not a kind of biblical Israel, but a kind of biblical Babylon. Yeah. And I began to call people away from any form of Christian nationalism, that's when we were then able to lose close to 1,500 people. And this was 2000, let's say, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, that period of time. And it was very painful. It was, in the words of Dickens, though, the best of times and the worst of times. It was the best of times because Perry and I were finding what we'd really been looking for all of our life, and we were never more excited to be Christians then in that period, we were just, it was so thrilling. And yet then to be misunderstood and maligned. And nobody was, I mean, now lots of people are speaking out against it. Yeah, this was, was, this was, this was the height of the Iraq way war. ahead of all of that. Yeah. And um, 
So, you know, I'm in town about the same size as Missoula. We're like 80,000 people. You know, it's about the same size. So I, I, I know what that feels like. And if you lose 1,500 people in a town that size, what does it mean? It means you see them everywhere you go. You go to the grocery store, there they are. If you do it right, you can see them in all 10 aisles. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was a painful time. I know, you know, we've been talking about this. Yeah. Perry's here with us on this trip, and we've talked about that. Now, I just, I, I know you know, but those that are... yeah. What our Eve, audience, those you know, that are eavesdropping upon our conversation, I do want them to know. Yeah. Just, just, so, just so you know, Perry and I are healthy, and happy, and well. It was a long journey, but we're there. You don't, I don't, I don't need sympathy. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, we're doing good. Well, this is so important for our church because we went through it, and I went through it. So that's mm -hmm. why our stories are so similar. It's whenever I disagree with you, I always do it with tongue in cheek because I'm kind of like. Our stories are so similar. Right. I'm probably going to agree with him at some point. <laughs> so yeah. I, I understand exactly. And our church needs to hear this because the ones who did stay and the ones who've come, they need to know what happened. So this is important. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's. How did you, can I, sorry to interrupt you, but how did you lay that out, the church? Like when you were like, you know what, this, mm. this mix of nationalism and America is a bad thing. Well, and I mean, I, I did it. I didn't do it all at once, but I did do it once was I remember in August of 2004 preaching a sermon called Consumer Christianity, which I was critiquing, and I, I said, I'm packing my bags from the charismatic church and moving on. Uh, when I say packing my bags, that, that also means taking the good stuff. It's not, it's not rejecting it all, right. but where the charismatic church in America had now positioned itself, I wasn't going to stay there. I'm not going to move on. And I did it with enough rhetorical skill that they applauded. Yes, we're moving on. They applauded until Forward. I actually did it. Yeah. <laughs> and then they said, whoa, hold Wait, on. what are you I putting put in the bag? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you leaving? So um, there, there, were, there were numerous theological emphases that shifted that were healthy and good, and I think it caused people maybe to cock their head a little bit for a little for just a few weeks and then okay yeah I see what we're doing most of it was palatable it was critiquing america as an empire that really had nothing to it wasn't part of god's redemptive agenda on the earth god didn't raise up america god raised up jesus from the dead right. you know that kind of talk um because you have the phenomenon in America, and it's not a new phenomenon. It's happened you know, over the last 17 centuries where the national agenda gets all mixed up with Christian language, vocabulary, vocabulary yeah. symbol. And so it becomes what we call technically civil religion. And the problem with civil religion, Christian civil religion, is ultimately, and it's hard for people to see this, the true object of worship is the state itself. Or the state itself is viewed as the primary vehicle by which God is going to achieve God's purposes. And so when I speak of America as an empire, I want to, because people hear that and they, what do you mean by that? Is that just right. an empty pejorative? You think of Star Wars. Right, <laughs> right. See, here's, here's, here's what I say. Um, empires are rich, powerful nations who believe they have a divine right to rule other nations and a manifest destiny to shape history according to their agenda. Now, in Scripture, uh, God seems to delight in nations, in their diversity, their ethnicity, all of that sort of thing, their various cultures. This seems to be part of God's plan, and it seems to be pleasing to God. But when a nation morphs into an empire, rich, powerful nation, believes it has a divine right to rule other nations, manifest destiny to shape history according to their agenda, that's when it becomes deeply problematic because what empires claim for themselves is what God has promised to His Son. It's Jesus who has a divine right to rule nations, manifest destiny to shape history. And so the Bible is, it actually maintains a fairly... Um, prominent critique of empire. You see it in Genesis. You see it especially in Exodus. It pops up various places through the prophets. You see it somewhat in the Gospels, and it's really pronounced in the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Um, and so it was that kind of... Because either you see the kingdom of God or you don't. 
And if you don't see the kingdom of God, then what you tend to see is your own nation and you have this mythological concept that God is working His purposes through your nation. Right. So I could go on and on and on, but the book that I address that the most clearly and somewhat in my book, Postcards from, it's, it shows up in all my books, but most pronounced in Postcards from Babylon and A Farewell to Mars. Yeah. So, you know, so we went through that, you know. And in some ways, though. What was the rub there? Like, meaning if you come out and give that message and it's clearly, because, I mean, again, I'm, I'm saying tongue in cheek because I've been doing that. Right. So I'm against Christian nationalism. America is not God's chosen nation. I don't even, I mean, I believe the church is Israel at this point. Yeah. But. I've always wondered what is, is it idolatry that people get upset at? Or what does that, why does that make people so upset? I have theories. Uh, I, I don't know that it answers all the questions, but we have to have a story, a framing narrative to make sense of our lives or else, you know, nothing makes sense and we're on the brink of nihilism. The gospel provides that story for us, but we have not been compelled by the gospel adequately enough in the American Christian context because the gospel is thin. It's not been storied. It's been reduced to a formula of how to go to heaven when you die. And so the story that most American Christians have is not just the story of Jesus and the apostles, Peter and Paul and the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's that along with George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson, and it's all mixed up together. And that, uh, as I've already alluded to, that America has a special place, not only in the earth, right. but in actually God's whole salvation agenda. Well, you hear it from nationalists that yeah. we are the last line of defense. Right. Not Jesus, right. not God. <laughs> That America is the last line of defense for the freedom of the world. Okay, so, so and you've traveled the world. So. so so here's the thing about America. America is a behemoth. It's huge. It's so big. I don't just mean it's continental sized and has what, the third most populous country, aren't we? India, China, maybe fourth, I think Indonesia, yeah. United States, fourth. I don't just mean it that way. I just mean culturally. So so when you say America. You are talking about four things, not one thing. You're talking about a country, a culture, an empire, and a religion. Hold on now. So, you know, as a nation, a country, a nation. Right. Yeah, it's 50, 50 states and we have the borders and you know what it is. And then as a culture, as you two saying, outside it's America. Outside it's America. I mean, I've traveled the world. I've been in 50 nations and I've never left America. I mean, because the McDonald's and the Coca-Cola and the movies and the Nike and everything else is always there to meet me. Right. And so America is a nation, but it's more than that. It's a global culture. As such, as a nation culture, America is a mixed bag. There are things through critique, but there are many things that are admirable. There are many things to celebrate. The entrepreneurial spirit of America is something that the rest of the world rightly admires. There's a kind of creative energy that has been part of our ethos and our history that I think is commendable. Then we though, then when we talk about as an empire, I've alluded to that, I've defined what I mean by that, then that becomes a challenge to the lordship of Jesus. Let him that has ears to hear, hear. And then finally, America, there, there is the religion of Americanism. And this will be the hardest one for some people to hear, but, but come on, think about it. Is it really disputable? America is a religion complete with creation myths, uh, founding fathers, sacred documents, canonical texts, sacred places, holy days, right. oh, yeah. and on and I on it goes. That, Liturgical that. gestures. <laughs> You know, instead of this, when the right anthem is played, it better be this. Right. And if you go to Washington, if you go to the Capitol, if you look up in the Capitol Rotunda, what do you see? You see the apotheosis of Washington. That, that's not my description of it. That's the name of it. What does that mean? Apotheosis, Greek, to make a god of, or the, deific the deification. 
The, the exaltation of, and what it is, you can look it up online, it's George Washington having ascended to heaven, flanked by the goddesses victory, and I think it's justice, victory and liberty, victory and liberty, and all the, it, it's the artist that created that, his previous commission was work in the Vatican. <laughs> and he came from the Vatican painting portraits of Christ seated in the heavens, now painting in the United States, in the capital, George Washington seated in the heavens. Seated That's there. religion, my friend. Mm. That's religion. Good and so, so, you know, so somebody just now just clicked off YouTube, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so that it was that kind of thing. Not that I necessarily, I didn't like drum on about this endlessly. I don't think, um, but but that can be a very sensitive point with people. Right. And if they're not willing to be all in and pledging all of their allegiance to Christ, then this creates a cognitive dissonance. That and let's face it, you may you may find this shocking, Scott, but Word of Life Church is not the only church in St. Joseph, Missouri. There are others. What? Yes, there are. Especially after they had to go somewhere. Well, that's my point. <laughs> I mean, once you make it, you know, that challenging, it's just it's easier to go somewhere else. And I also want to say this. I really, though it broke my heart, though it was painful, though it saddened me, uh, I, I don't blame those people. I wish they could have stayed with us. I think it would have been good for them. Yeah, work through the fear. But I, I need, but I... I understand, and so did any of them ever come back? Yes, some did, not a lot, but some did. But I think more what's happened because it's been twenty years, you know, or fifteen years, depending where you want to date it. But um, I think a lot of people saw me going off the rails, and they thought, you know, within another six months to two years, Brian will just be, I don't know, a Democrat and an atheist, atheist yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. And now it's been 20 years and they go, well, I don't know. He still talks about Jesus an awful lot. Right. And so when I do encounter these people, which of course I do all the time in St. Joseph, uh, there's no anxiety. That's I don't good. ever sense any, any side, either any animosity. There's a bit of nostalgia, you know, and they almost always, if not literally always, are glad to see me, speak kind. Good. And uh, so I think that's all kind of been healed. Although I say that, and I think that's true. I think that's true. But the rise of Christian nationalism now is so severe that it may add some other tensions, but I don't know. Yeah. And it kind of, I mean, it's, we're hitting the precipice. Of right. it. And again, I hope so. I hope. Yeah, I, me I, too. Anyone listening to this has known I've preached against it too. And I want to, so this is, I want to get into this, the state of the church, but I think okay. this would be good to touch on because you and I just, we just had a conversation about Trump, a couple mm -hmm. of them. Who, and, oh, did and we? I, I, and I learned, I actually learned a lot. Like and it, we're very similar in this because the same way um, that as soon as you say stuff like that, you're instantly labeled a liberal or a Democrat, right? right? I mean, that happens to me all the time. So I'm yeah. like, oh, so you're a, you're, a, you're a woke liberal. And I'm just like, so you were very vocal against Trump, not against Trump, but against people following Trump right. in that way. And I think this is a great opportunity because I understand what you're saying now. I really do get what you're saying. It's, it's not an attack on the individual right. Christian who is like, what do I do? I gotta, I gotta, I gotta vote for somebody. But just your heart behind it. Means what a lot, I'm concerned so. about is the import of religious mentality into the realm of politics. If you just say, you know what, I'm on the elephant team, I like the elephants, or I'm on the donkey team, I like the donkeys, I'm fine with that. I really don't care. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I myself, I'm not picking teams, I just don't. Uh, but if you just keep it in the realm of the purely political, I like. Re public and I like elephant politics, I like donkey, I like Democrat politics, cool, whatever. It's when you start saying um, God has raised up this elephant or God has anointed this donkey. And I'm saying, you know what? It's the lamb, my friend. Right. It's the lamb. It's the lamb alone. So if you, if you want to have a certain, I think, I think for Christians, it's wise maybe to temper any kind of political passion. That's my opinion. But it, if you are going to have passion politically, 
keep it political and resist the temptation to say, and God is on my side on this, and God is doing this, and God is that. Who God has raised up is Jesus Christ from the dead, and Jesus is Lord. And let's be a little bit more theological here. Um, Karl Barth, I'm going to say something, then I'm going to have to unpack it. Karl Barth had this saying, God cannot serve, God can only rule. Now, he does not mean by that that God cannot be revealed in the humble Christ who washes the feet of his disciples. He doesn't mean that. What he means is, because he's saying this in the context of the rise of Nazi uh, politics in Germany in the 1930s, supported by the evangelical church. Yeah, the Catholic church. Yeah, right. So he's saying God cannot serve some other interest. God has his own kingdom his own politics, and that's how he's going to reign and rule. Here's the problem with the Christian right and Christian left. Christian gets reduced to adjective duty in service to the all-important political noun. So we say Christian right, Christian left, what we really mean is right and left. And what we then do is tag Christian on it to say, look, see, God's on our side, and we trot out Jesus as the mascot. And both sides do this. Both sides do this. And I, I just want to be done with that. Now, if some of my uh, passion has been more directed toward some of the religious right, it's simply that's because those are the people I know. And in, the, in this particular cultural political moment... Because you never did this before until no, Trump. So, no. yeah, yeah. so in this particular cultural moment, I am concerned about you know, a MAGA version of Christianity. And I, I feel like I need to try to check that, check that, and, and say, well, well, hold on to your politics if you must, but uncouple it from the name of Jesus. Because that's really what it is to take the name of the Lord in vain. Right. And that's a good word. And like I said, I, I want to rise, because you cleared that up for me too. I've misjudged you on that. Because, one, because I didn't know you before, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's one thing I'm like, I'm reading Sinners in the Hands of the Lo- Loving God, and then it's like a tweet, like, Boom. So, but it's I didn't, a, it's, I didn't know it's the a context. minefield, brother. I do know that. Yeah, I didn't know the context before, yeah. but I, I get it. I actually, I totally get it now. And we can both, we've both agreed. I, I want, I want the salvation of Donald Trump's soul. I, yeah. I just, I, I would love him just to go play golf <laughs> for the next four years instead. Yeah. But that was one of the hard things for me too, was just like when I, I did talk to progressives at our church and, you know, and they'd say, well, Jesus would want us to vote this way. And I'm like, well, yeah. that's exactly what you were condemning. Look, right if you start playing that, that game, game, you can, you, then you handpick your issues. Right. You know, say, with, with this issue, and I'm not even going to give an example because I'm just not going to go down that path. Yeah. But in this issue, this issue, this issue, you got to vote like a Republican. In this issue, this issue, this issue, you got to vote by, like a Democrat. I just think, I think the whole thing is a trap once we start going into that world. Having said that, I, I want to be careful here. Political theology is, for me, the most difficult, and I do plenty of it, because there's always this balance of, on the one hand, I want to say, stay transcendent, because Christianity without transcendence degenerates into politics. We don't need that. On the other hand, politics in its purest form is the pursuit of the common good. And I don't want to just say, I don't care what happens. Right. Uh, cause let's, let's be honest here. I am, you know, a 64 year old, relatively affluent white male. Well, the whole system is rigged in my favor. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if I say, oh, I'm, I'm too pure to even touch anything political. I got to be careful yeah. that that isn't saying to other people, well, too bad. You know, you're not in my lucky position. And so. If we, if we are to speak of the politics of Jesus, I would say the politics of Jesus is to do your best to keep the big people from hurting the little people <laughs> and, and to give some sort of prioritization to the little people, whatever we mean by little people, the people that don't have as much influence, position, power, privilege, all of that sort of thing. Uh, they need to be considered and cared for. Amen. And that's where you wrote postcards from Babylon. Yeah, describing um, that break from Christian nationalism, right? And politics, and, um, but you also wrote "Water to Wine." 
Yes. And that was that's literally the only one I ever read. So I got to be and, honest and with the that's audience. That's the strangest that thing, weird? Scott, because that's the one that you will relate to the most. I know. Well, I promise you. That's I'm, good. I'm not trying to sell books here, folks. No, I'm just no. telling Scott that he, I just wanted to be honest. Yeah. He, you're gonna love this book. Great. You're gonna love it. Well, just, you're gonna say, "Well, I could have written this book." <laughs> <laughs> Twenty years later. Um, but then you know you you did write a book called "Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God." Yes. And uh, that's why we brought you to Missoula. And we hope to bring you back again um, because this is just, this is kind of a hinge but moment. By the way, let me just say, other than a few forays on vacation, this is the first time I've spent any real time in Montana. And I like Montana. What do you think of Glacier National Park? Look. And this is a mountain look, climber. Look, this is a mountain climber. I love the national parks. And I've been in a lot of them. And I had, and I, people have told me about Glacier, and I had high expectations. It totally exceeded those expectations. It kind of blew my mind. Awesome. I'm, not, I'm not saying that to flatter you. It's not your park. <laughs> yeah, I didn't make it. <laughs> you just live here. Yeah. But, but man, I, now, you know, Perry and I, I've already, I've already bought a trail map, and we're already talking about, when can we come oh, back? And, you know. You always got a place to stay. Yeah, we, so. we loved it. I, I, here, this will be nice. We can get back to centers no, in a great. second here. But this is a nice bridge between politics and theology. Uh, some people have described the national parks is America's best idea. Well, it's certainly up there. And uh, the idea that 110 years ago or yeah. so, or that was happening a lot, like between like 115 and 100 years ago or so, we started setting aside these major tracts of wilderness to spare them from, you know, rapacious development and all of that sort of thing. That was a good idea. Yeah. God bless Teddy. And yeah. And so, yeah. So I'm a big fan of Glacier National Park after only one visit. Perfect. Well, <laughs> and you just scratched the surface, my friend. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we brought you in because of that book. And that was, you know, as I described to the audience that that was, that was like, it was almost so, by the way, uh, Dallas Willard's book, Divine Conspiracy, mm -hmm. was my trigger too. Like that was my it's a gateway drug. It really was. Like, and I what's funny thing is I got that book when I was in seminary and I never read it. Right. And it sat on my bookshelf. And when we were going through our massive change, I just grabbed it randomly and read it. So that book as well. But your book was given to me again by someone else, and I had no clue who you were, nothing. <laughs> And I devoured that book in one you night. You know, sometimes the right books, by the grace of God, appear in our lives. Oh, man. I read it in one night. I stayed up oh, really? all night wow. and read it. But it was a shift from Postcards of Babylon, yeah. you know, and, and like, so you, you made this turn into a, a better good news. Well, actually, so, yeah. Yeah. What was, what, why did you feel that book like necessary to write? Well, uh, uh, okay. I had written some of the books I'd written previously were Unconditional, which is a book on forgiveness. It's The paperback version is now called Radical Forgiveness. They're the same book. Okay. <laughs> I wish the publisher hadn't changed the title because people think it's they're two different books. They're not. Was, I didn't do it. Unconditional slash Radical Forgiveness, a book on forgiveness. Uh, Beauty Will Save the World and A Farewell to Mars. And, and you know, they have to do with forgiveness. They have to do with Discerning Truth Through Beauty, Recognizing the Beauty of Christ and the Beauty of the Gospel, and a book on peace, the nature of peace within the peaceable kingdom of Christ. And so I knew that I had an audience that was resonating with what I was saying. And so that, for example, if I would assert that God is in fact ontologically in God's very being, not angry, violent, or retributive, I knew there were people who say, yes, I believe that's true. I believe that's true. But they're still got their Bible. And if I want to, Scott, if I want to paint a picture of God as angry, violent, and retributive, I know how to do it. I use this as my palette, and I take my selected texts, and when I get done, I have painted a picture of an angry God, a violent God, a retributive God. And so there were people who I knew were wanting to come with me, but, but sincerely, not, not in sort of a just argumentative stance, right. but in a sincere, yeah, but what about 
fear of the Lord? What about the wrath of God? Yeah. What about Old Testament violence? What about the supposed divine violence of the cross? What about hell? That's a big one. What about the book of Revelation? And so even though I don't say it anywhere in the book that this is what I'm doing, that's what I'm doing. I'm addressing right. those issues, saying, I understand your concern. I get it. I'm with you. But the full revelation of God is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the true Word of God that becomes the lens for interpreting this canonical text Word of God. And so, so that's what the book's about. Would you say that um, when you say He's the lens for the Bible, Jesus is, can you say now, like if you read something in the Old Testament that doesn't line up with Jesus, that it's false? Yeah, I don't know if I would put, I don't know if I would put that fine a point on it. I would say it's false. False. I mean, I, actually, there are passages of scriptures that, and we, and I talked about one Sunday morning, so we right. might as well just go there. So there's this, there's this text. I won't turn to it. I can quote it. But in First Samuel 15, you have the prophet Samuel claiming. You see, he knows how I'm couching my language carefully here. Yeah. Claiming, thus saith the Lord, that the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel, told him to tell King Saul that he, Yahweh, through the mouth of prophet Samuel, has decided to destroy the Amalekites for what they had done when Israel came into the promised land. Centuries earlier. Yeah, they wanted I mean, revenge. I mean, centuries <laughs> have gone. Well, yes. <laughs> centuries have gone by. And according to, to Samuel, God has now decided to obliterate them. And so... King Saul is instructed to get together an army and go attack and utterly, this is the word, utterly destroy the Amalekites, do not spare them, kill them all, like, you know, Metallica, their first album, (laughs) kill them all, kill men, women, children, babies. I mean, it's a jarring text. 1 Samuel 15, verse 3, for those of you that are keeping score at home. So you say, okay, men killing men. Ah, you know, that's what war is. I think Christ is going to challenge that concept too. But, you know, we at least find that normative as far as war goes. Then you have men killing women and we're, we're squirming. And then we're told, we're told that, that uh, the, these Israeli soldier men, Israelite soldier men should kill children and kill babies. What do you do with that? Um, I mean, I don't necessarily need to repeat my sermon here for right. this podcast, but I said that you can question the morality of God or the immutability of God, or we can question how we read Scripture, and I choose the latter. But so if you say to me, if you like, just pin me up against the wall and you say, BZ, did God, did God? I feel like someone's Saul, giving you this to tell thing. Samuel to kill women, babies, and children. I'm going to go, of course he didn't. Of course God didn't do that. Of course The not. God that we know now, has been revealed now, in Jesus. Let, let, let's, let, let, let's say, let's do be aware of the fact that we are reading this text 3,000 years later, following at least 2,000 years of Christian revelation, indeed through the lens of Christ that one group of people in the late Bronze Age would attack another group of people claiming their God told them to go kill them all. Well, that was pretty standard operating procedure. That was Sunday's news. You know, that's, that's the way things were. But if we're going to say, yes, and I believe that that's who God is, well, that's why John, at the end of his, his uh, poetic prologue, entrance to the gospel, Introduction to his gospel, the last verse, verse 18 of chapter 1, he says, No one has ever seen God. The only begotten Son who's near God, He has made Him known. And so when, when, when John, the apostle, mind you, this is not you know, John some liberal theologian at Berkeley. Right. This is John the apostle says, No one's ever seen God. That includes prophet Samuel. He's saying, yeah, okay, there were glimpses, there were hints. There were things they were picking up, but they weren't always getting it right. If you're talking about having seen God in perfection, no one has ever seen God. It's the only begotten Son who's near the Father's heart, who's made Him known. 
And so if you can't legitimately conceive of Jesus telling, you know, well, well, it shows up. This actually happened. We don't have to just like imagine it. So Jesus and his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem. They're going through Samaria. You know, they're, they're, they're wayfaring strangers. They're traveling. They, they've got to find lodging. And they come to a Samaritan village and they're refused hospitality because of the cultural religious tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. And James and John, who Jesus aptly nicknames the sons of thunder, <laughs> says, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven and consume them? Shall we, Lord, can, can we authorize a divine drone strike upon this village? Because <laughs> we, we know and, you've done it before. And, yeah. and they had this, as Elijah did. Or no, yeah, Elijah. And they're actually referring to um, when the, the king sent, the king of Israel sent an arresting party out to, to apprehend Elijah. I'm not, I don't want to keep repeating the whole story, but it's in, it's in 2 Kings 1. Uh, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. It happens once, it happens twice. The third time the guy begs for mercy and okay. So, so you have, so they can say it's in the Bible. Jesus said, Elijah called down fire from heaven and killed a bunch of people. Can we do that? And Jesus says, What's wrong with you, you knuckleheads? That's, that's the literal Greek. <laughs> no, he's a message. No. He's, yes, he says, he says, You do not know what kind of spirit you're of. God did not send the Son of Man to destroy lives, but to save them. All right? So, if you can't imagine Jesus saying, Disciples, I want you to go into that Samaritan village and kill them all, men, women, children, babies. It is Jesus who is the perfect revelation of who God is and always has been. So we learn to read those Old Testament passages in the light of Christ. And there's a name for that. It's called Christianity. <laughs> That's what Christians do. I've often used that uh, against, with, not against, but uh, when I know they're pro-life, right? Right. And I'm always like, good for you, right? I'm like, good for you. And I said, so what about now? Do you think it's okay if a Muslim woman has an abortion? And they're always like, well, no. And I'm like, because, you know, they're different, different right. cultures. And I say, but when God said, go kill men, women, <laughs> children, and babies, when right. God does it, that's fine. And they're, it's, they're usually stumped, but then it always comes down to like, well, when God does it, yes, it is fine because perfect. And I'm, I'm always just kind of like, None of this makes sense to me. Right. It's either no, right it, or wrong. No, it actually right? doesn't make it's sense. It's either right or wrong, you know? So would you say that you, because we're talking about the character of God. Yeah. Um, would you say that that's what you were trying to reveal is the character of God? And like why it's important? Why is it important to know which character of God is true? Yeah, because we've arrived at a point where there is in general in the minds of many Christians a profound um, difference between the nature of the Father and the nature of the Son, the character of the Father, the character of the Son, the disposition of the Father, the disposition of the Son. And then what we end up with is Jesus saving us from God. That God has this component to Him that is harsh, demanding, and implacable that Jesus was able to soothe and satisfy and that's how we got in. And that may be a, somewhat of a characterization or a caricature, but it's not that far from really what's being preached. And of course, this is, to put it, put, to put it gently, terrible theology. Yeah, it's penal substitution. It's terrible theology because you have, there's so many things wrong with it. You, 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 in, you, in, you do violence to the Trinity. You're pitting the Father and the Son against, against one another. Other. Yeah. Uh, you, are, you are imagining Jesus, the Son, acting as an agent of change upon the Father, who in fact is immutable and doesn't change. And so what is being changed is not God's mind toward us, but our mind toward God. So in John's Gospel, it's so clear. Jesus repeatedly says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I want to do what the Father does. I want to say what the Father says. The Father and I are one. And so Jesus is not an alternative to the Father or changing the Father. Jesus is revealing the Father for they are one. So what that leaves us with is, okay, 
In the long journey of revelation of the covenant people, the, the seed of Abraham, they have a long journey to make. And they begin where they have to begin. They begin as a Bronze Age people in a polytheistic world of violent gods and goddesses. We probably would have thought the same well, thing. Well, of course we would yeah. have. And, and they're on a journey. So that the, so the Old Testament is the divine inspired telling of Israel's story of coming to know the living God. See, here, here's the thing, Scott. People imagine that the Old Testament is univocal. It's not. I mean, there are various opinions given. So right. you're seeing this journey of these people. So, for example, if you ask the Old Testament, hey, Old Testament, well, let's do it this way. Let's gather some of the representatives of the Old Testament. Let's have some prophets, some psalmists, some priests, some Levites, you know. Let's get them all here in the room. And we say, well, we got a question for you. Does God, the living God, the true and living God, require ritual blood sacrifice? Uh, Scott and I are going to get a cup of coffee. We'll be back in about 15 minutes. You can give us your answer. We come back 15 minutes later, and the room's in a fist fight because they don't agree. Because I can take you to Leviticus and I can show you where it says that these particular sacrifices are required day by day for the forgiveness of sins. But then you get to Psalm 40, which, you know, we might be talking a thousand years have gone by. And the psalmist says, burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. You have opened my ear. <laughs> and then you get to Hosea, who oh, very yeah. boldly the in the name of the Lord says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And by the way, Jesus quotes that twice. So, yes, it's inspired, but it's an inspired telling of a theological journey that a people are making together. And so, in one sense, the Bible doesn't stay above, stand above the story it tells, but it is also part of the story. It, yeah. it, it's, it itself is on the journey toward the true perfect revelation of God who is Jesus Christ. And so what the Bible needs to do perfectly, it does perfectly. And what it needs to do perfectly is point us to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And that's Jesus. Yeah, you said something, I think you tweeted it at one point, but it, that, this, one, this was like a hinge moment for me when you said the Bible submits to Christ. Yeah. See, we've always, we've always had it like the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and well, Holy Bible. But if Christ is the perfect word, the Bible submits to Christ too. Right. Yeah, and so, so one of the real problems in evangelical Christianity in general, in fundamentalist Christianity in particular, is this conflation of the Bible and Jesus as some sort of single you see it entity. Online all the time. You're like, how do you And not it's see just it's not, not true. God's not a book. <laughs> N.T. Wright says that at the end of Matthew, Jesus says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth is given unto me. And he doesn't say, and this is N.T. Wright, he didn't say, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto a book you chaps are going to write. <laughs> you can hear N.T. Wright like, say uh, that. Yeah. A book you chaps you are going to write. <laughs> So, and then within your book, um, and this is a, a good one for us to touch on, is it's really the, the picture of judgment, but you had a whole section on hell. Right. Um, and you use the word apocatastasis. Yeah. Uh, you shy away from universalism. Um, I don't mind using that term too much because, one, I think 20 years ago, I understand how hard that word would have hit. Um, now it still hits hard, but people kind of know what it is actually in a little bit. But, um, I, but I'm afraid they too often... Uh, go to a pop, cheap universalism oh, yeah, like where there's no accountability, weak, no weak judgment. Yeah. So, and, I mean, that's me. Like, so I use the word apocatastasis just because people don't know what it is. Yeah. And then they go, what? What do you mean? I then said, well, and then unpack. I can say, well, let me explain it to you. And it is, you know, as you know, it's a biblical word. It's in Acts 3.21. It's, in, at least in the NRSV, it's translated as universal restoration. Other translations, the restoration of all things. A The concept is this Julian of Norwich uh, idea that all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. That's the hope that I hold to. Uh, the Apostle Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, that in the end, God will be all in all. Theopos and pos, God all in all. So if we arrive at some point in our history, where within the cosmos, God is all in all. Well, that's 
that's the hope. Right. That's, I, I do want to ask people, would you be happy? Yeah, are you okay with it? Are you okay? Yeah. That, 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 that God is all in all? That, that is, that all things are reconciled unto God and all things are in harmony with God and with everything else. If everything is put right, including all the people who have ever lived, can you entertain that notion and be happy about it? Or do you say, no, I really want some people to suffer consciously forever. If you say that, I say, well, you probably still have some suffering that lies ahead for you. <laughs> until you can come to the place where you can be willing to hope for mercy for all. Right. And that's what I would, I think that too, is like if God, whatever hell is, it's not absence of God, right. you know, because he's all in all and he's everything, he's everywhere. And it's well, all summed up. Christ in descended in into Sheol, death, Hades, hell, lower parts of the earth, and then ascended into the heavens that he might fill all things everywhere with himself. So that now for a human being, to experience death is not to encounter death, but to encounter Christ. I mean, anecdotally, we always have this, these near-death stories, almost always, what are they journeying toward? A light. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm going to suggest that this light has a face, and it's the glory of God in the face of Christ. So at my Christian faith informs me that when any human being dies, what they encounter is not death, but Christ, Christ both as judge and as Savior. Well, I want to finish this last part of this podcast because you wrote another book um, <laughs> called When Everything's on Fire. And it's a response to um, people not just leaving the faith, but questioning their faith. And right. really, we call it deconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't use that term anymore. I call it um, like rebuild, really. Because yeah. I, I view deconstruct. Right. I view my own deconstruction as like, I, I took some boards down off my house. The foundation stayed the same. And I put some new boards up with some mm -hmm. fresh paint. Um, but you've been a leading voice in all this because you saw it coming. Like you saw this mass exodus coming. Um, but you also have seen some of the dangers I have seen where people right. kind of deconstruct into nothing and agnosticism right. and all those things. So you wanted to kind of level that out. So I guess what I'm saying is where, where do you see deconstruction right now um, where the people who have kind of left the evangelical movement. Um, and what would your, what would your hope be for them? And your, yeah. and what would your wise, your wisdom be for people who basically see the BS you and I have seen in the church and a lot of people have, but where's the, what's the hope? Yeah. Like you, deconstruction isn't my favorite term. It actually comes to us from philosophy. It's given to us by the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, where he applies it to uh, analysis of texts that we deconstruct texts to find the hidden <laughs> bids for power that lurk therein. Um, so I, I don't really prefer that terminology. If for no other reason, it's, it's a little bit misappropriated from Derrida. And secondly, it just sounds too much like destruction. Yeah. Deconstruction, destruction. <clears throat> but I, I can't change that which has become the vernacular. So it is a terminology that is current among us. So, okay, I accept that. But whatever deconstruction is, is it's not an end. It's a method. It's, it's something where, okay, I've reached the point where the faith that I have either inherited or somehow cobbled together is no longer tenable. I see, I see the inherent hypocrisies. I see the contradictions. And so what do I do? Well, now we engage in a critical rethinking of the faith. Uh, you can call that deconstruction, fine. Uh, it's really sort of a quest to find something better, more enduring, more beautiful. So in my own, the, I mean, the metaphor I reached for was water to wine. Uh, I, I realized finally that the Christianity I knew was too thin, too weak, and I wanted something to happen. And I... You know, Jesus said, seek and you will find. And I did. And Jesus turned my water to wine. Hallelujah. So that's the language that I use. Um, the phenomenon known as Christian deconstruction is almost entirely a phenomenon within the evangelical slash fundamentalist Protestant world. Not, a, not entirely, but that's, that's the bulk of it. And what I would urge people to understand is that 
Fundamentalist evangelicalism does not represent the whole of Christianity. And, <laughs> and, and so before you say, I'm done and pitch it all, maybe take a moment and explore the wider, more historical Christian faith. Look into the Anglican world. Look into some aspects of the best that Catholicism has to offer. Explore this mysterious world that so many Western Christians know nothing of that is the entire Eastern half of Christianity, <laughs> known as Orthodoxy. And I really don't know of too many questions, if any, that people are raising that hasn't been something that people have been addressing for a very long time in the church. And so the methodology of deconstruction can be a hopeful path, path toward a better, more beautiful, more sustaining Christianity. And that's what I hope for it to be for people. If you make it an end in itself, well, you can't deconstruct forever and have anything left at the end of the day. And so I liken it unto someone that, you know, imagine a beautiful icon that had been lost and it's found now in some monastery. And uh, let's say in, in, in Poland, they find some, you know, icon that's a thousand years old. It's a, it's a Christ Pantocrator. But it's over the centuries, it's been covered with a patina of dirt and grime and incense smoke. And you can hardly see the image of Christ, but you know it's there. And so what are you going to do? You're going to recover it. And when they bring in the restoration artist to work on this icon, in her toolkit, there will not be dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> So they, make it better. There, yeah. There'll be mild solvents and brushes and whatever else. And so I would urge people, look, Christian faith is a precious thing. Don't just attack it with a sledgehammer and a stick of dynamite. Um, un deal gently with it. Get some counsel from maybe those outside that which has been your experience. And uh, see if you can't recover the beautiful face of Christ shining through that is able to fascinate you for the rest of your life and into eternity. Good word. That's good. Uh, you recently tweeted out that evangelicalism is a failed experiment. Yeah, hey, that's, you know, that's a bit... Um, I'm, I'm brandishing something about there. Okay, that's provocative. Mm -hmm. Um, so I agree with it, so but I, I know you, I know well, you mean something I, I, else. I, 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 I mean several is. things. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I think it has been so intent on being disconnected from the historical ground of the faith and purely rooted in modern American soil that it's too much like, you know, that parable that Jesus gives that it had no root and it only endured for a while and then withered away. And I'm afraid we have been incapable of producing a Christian that can resolutely be countercultural. We tend to just go with the various cultural winds of America and slap a Jesus fish on it. And that would be an example of us failing to make true disciples. So I, I think whatever is necessary to sustain faith in the American context, it's going to have a greater rootedness in, the, in what we know as the great tradition. This is what, by the great tradition, we mean what uh, Christians have always believed and practiced. Now, you're going to find this in three main denominations. You're going to find this in Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, and Anglican Communion. I want to stress, you don't have to become any of those. If right. you do, fine, I'll celebrate it. But, but what you can do is draw from those wells. Yes. What you can do is recognize that Christianity is a received faith. We don't get to make it up. <laughs> Christianity is not, you know, 150 years old like American evangelicalism. Christianity is not 500 years old like Protestantism. All of which made important contributions, by yes. the way. I'm not yeah. just dismissing them. Christianity is 2,000 years old, <laughs> and we need to have a greater respect for the more ancient faith in a contemporary context. And that's, that's what we've been doing. And um, I remember when I first had that thought, though, that, that Christianity in America has become a failed experiment. 
And I'll, I'll just tell you what it was. I'll tell you what prompted it. There was a survey, like a Gallup survey. So it's, you know, relatively scientifically done. And they were surveying different religious groups in America. Various variations of Christian, you know, Catholic, mainline Protestant, etc. Jewish, atheists, because that is a religious category. And the question was, and this is actually, you know, at the height of the Gulf War, so it's, this is not new, this goes back quite a ways. Um, should the United States uh, torture suspected terrorists? And the only group that was over 50% yes was evangelical. Now, this is despite the way, first of all, torture is actually illegal <laughs> in the United States. I mean, the United States government says you can't do that. And then even more so, you know, what, what are the ethics of Christ? Well, how does Christ inform us on treating our enemies? Uh, and yet you have the only, not the atheists, not the mainline Protestants, not the Catholics, only the evangelicals had a majority of people saying, no, we suspect, we're not sure, but we suspect they're terrorists. Yeah, we should torture them. <laughs> That's I thought. Okay, we somewhere this experiment has failed. Yeah, yeah. So what's the what's your hope for it? Like, uh, where do you see the church in twenty years? When um, you are eighty one years old. Lord have mercy. <laughs> um, and I'll be eighty four in twenty years. But um, I well I I don't I don't know. It's, it's Niles Bohr said um, prediction is very difficult, especially concerning the future. <laughs> but. My no, but you, my, you're covering four my, generations, man. Yeah, so my like hope does. Decades. Yeah, my hope lies in this, in what we've been already alluding to, and that is a younger generation, not trying to relive the past, not trying to retreat to the past, but a younger generation respecting our ancient roots and saying, "All right, if I engage in some of the practices." That the church has been doing for millennia, and I begin to pay attention to how the earlier Christians, I'm talking about the church fathers in particular, right. spoke of the Christian faith, and I allow those nutrients and those practices to form me here in the 21st century, what might Christianity look like? And I'm finding more and more people who say, yeah, yeah I'm down for that. I mean, I, I'm not going to, you know, like, try to go live in a Renaissance fair and pretend that we live in a, in a different time than we do. But I really am interested in maybe uh, bringing in some Gregory of Nyssa. You know, maybe I'll pay attention to Maximus the Confessor. All these are strange names to most people. Uh, I'm going to maybe begin to pray some of the ancient prayers, the, the kinds of prayers that Christians have prayed all through the ages and see how that forms me. And I'm going to intentionally be less American and more ancient, less contemporary as far as source. Now, expression can be contemporary, but more ancient in deriving uh, what the church has always practiced and believed. And so kind of a, as I'm not the one who's coined this phrase, but an ancient future faith, a, a faith for the future drawing upon uh, our ancient roots and ancient wells. That's my hope. And, and I believe it's a um, valid hope. I, I mean, I'm seeing it. Yeah, you're here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, see, I, see, I, I saw it Sunday morning at the Zootown Church yeah. where, where, you know, you got the rock band, keep on rocking in the free world. Will do. Uh, but there's liturgy. We had meditations. There's Eucharist. It's called Eucharist, you know. And uh, I love that blend. Because uh, Jesus said, every scribe instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasury things new hmm. and things old. That's my hope. The last question is, I get a ton of DMs and e emails from other pastors right. navigating this, trying to navigate this because we're all going through the same crap. Mm -hmm. Like we got people mad at us. We got people calling us heretics. As a man who was a forerunner for this 20 mm -hmm. years ago, who laid the groundworks, took the whippings. What would be your advice to a guy like me and other pastors that I would yeah, share this with? Yeah, I, I do have to advice. navigate the Reformation. I, I think it's this will sound just really bland and practical, I, you know, because I can speak abstractly. Yeah, I'm going to give you something real. I think the place to start 
is to bring the church calendar into your church. We all like the church calendar to a certain extent because we like Christmas and Easter. Right. And it's, it's funny, and people don't think of that as being church calendar stuff, but it is. I mean, that's where it comes Absolutely, from. Yeah. And so, well, not just Christmas, but let's add then. Not just Easter, but Lent leading up to it. Talk about, you know, the seasons of Epiphany and the season that e that Easter is a season. Right. And then there, there are 12 days of Christmas. It turns out the Christmas carol is right. <laughs> and that will begin to shape our year. And instead of having to find some other way to give narrative structure to the life of our church, let's just take the one that's been given to us, the church calendar, and then maybe we bring in... Um, yeah, what do you bring in next? Well, it could be, but maybe maybe you begin to pay attention to the lectionary. The idea that Christians all over the world, by the millions, are hearing these texts read on Sunday morning. Maybe, maybe join that community, that global community who are hearing these texts read, and maybe begin to preach on them. Uh, I am a great proponent that. Every Sunday should be a gathering around the table, which means whatever you want to call it, Eucharist, Lord's Supper, communion is offered Sunday by Sunday because that's, that's the high point. Right. I mean, I think the hope for the future is that our churches become, um, I don't know, I would call it perhaps uh, a subculture of sacramental practice. If, if we can begin to understand that at its heart, Christianity is not an abstract faith, but it's a sacramental faith. That, and this will sound strange to people, but it's true. To practice Christianity properly, you need not just abstract ideas and concepts about salvation and heaven and whatever else. You need water. You need bread. You need wine. You need oil. And we are at our heart not an abstract, ethereal faith, but a sacramental faith. So begin to maybe start with the church calendar. That's the simplest way. And then begin to explore some of these other things and begin to, and you don't have to get rid of your rock band. You don't have to get all got up investments, you know, because um, I think those are more peripheral. I don't know that those are essential, but I do think, you know, baptism and communion are essential. And I think a, uh, I don't know that it's essential. But incorporating the church calendar as a way of structuring your church life will bear great dividends because it, it makes us a, a community that is other. So, so we, have, we have two Not calendars. Just one day. Yeah. We, we, have, we, have a, we have a calendar that tells us what day to go to the dentist or whatever it is and all that. But we also have this other calendar, the sacred calendar, that is actually very wisely has been put together that takes us through the story of anticipating his birth his birth, the story of his life, his journey to the cross, his death, burial, resurrection, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and then all the way through ordinary time and start over again. So we have this beautiful calendar that enables us to tell the story of Jesus through the entire year. I think that's, I think that's a good place to start. Well, thank you, Brian, for this podcast. But mostly, thanks for having the courage to do what you did 20 years ago. Thank There's, you. Like you probably never even envisioned you'd be sitting in Montana mm. talking to someone who's gone through the same stuff. But like your story and your church's story and Perry's story, the vulnerability, the honesty of it has really helped me. And it's helping others because there's a lot of people going through a lot of loss of relationships, yeah. a lot of uh, words thrown at us. But you went through it and you stuck with the same church for 42 years. Yeah. So God bless you, man. Seriously, thank you for going through that. Thank you, Scott. Lord bless you.